Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 811. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 11th, 2023. All right, you're watching another program of Anglican Unscripted. We really appreciate that. We do. We know that this show is as much about what we like to talk about in our webcams, but it's also you guys, the viewers, coming here, watching, commenting, sharing the show, liking the show, and we really appreciate that. If you have not had a chance to subscribe to Anglican Unscripted, this is your opportunity. You're going to see on the uh, YouTube page, there's a thumbs up, there's a subscribe rectangle, and then there's a bell that pops up. You've done it before, you're prolific YouTube users. You've now subscribed to Anglican Unscripted. We appreciate that. George, how are you doing this week? I'm doing fantastic. Church life uh, is slowing down and picking up. Had a wedding on Saturday. That's always a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. uh, put Susan on Susan's birthday was yesterday and for her birthday present she's flying out to be with our daughter in San Francisco and the one from Seattle's coming down interesting our daughter is moving out of San Francisco our hippie daughter cannot take it anymore she's got a beautiful place that she shares in Pacific uh, Heights and she just can't afford it I mean the rent was up to now four thousand dollars for basically a two bedroom apartment where she has to pay half and as she says you know all the young people are leaving San Francisco because they're being priced out and the fun stuff to do in San Francisco is no longer fun because the of the conditions on, on the streets in some of the commercial areas of you know the homeless and the drugs and the needles mm -hmm. and everything so she is uh, going from the frying pan into the fire she's moving across the bay to Berkeley so uh, there you have it. She, she can join all the little communists in uh, Berkeley, <laughs> California. Well, my cousin who lived on the shore uh, in San Francisco had a very, you know, a million dollar, multi million dollar house on the shore, moved as well. And if he moved, the conditions are really bad. And I joke with him well, most residents in San Francisco have indoor and outdoor plumbing. And, uh, you know, that, that may be your big problem is so many people are using the outdoor problem. And it, it's one of those things you, you see politically that uh, it's been run by one party for so long uh, over the, the decades that they don't know. They don't know how to solve the problem they've created. What, yeah. One little thing, just, you know, for instance, uh, Laura has a car mm -hmm. and she has she has to have indoor covered parking. And I said, well, why do you have to have that? She said, because if you park on the street, your car will be broken yeah, into and the radio yeah. stolen. And there's and the police can do and will do nothing about it. So if you don't want your car repeatedly broken into, it's like New York City was in the late 70s, where people would put no radio signs on the side of their side window of the car so people wouldn't break in. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the breakdown of law and order is so... Uh, you know, it used to be, you know, when she moved there a few years ago, it was confined to certain districts. But now that's just spreading to all parts of the city. So Pacific Heights is a beautiful, beautiful section. It, you can see the ocean. Um, and even there, they're start, they don't have the homeless so much on the streets, but now the crime is spreading outward uh, to the uh, wealthier districts. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know... And then the young people who basically sort of give life and verve to a city are being priced out as well as driven out to be able to afford to live there. They have to live in the bad sections. And after a while, you just don't want to have your car broken into or live live where you have a homeless man defecating in front of your apartment building on the street. No, it's a strange problem. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus being very, very prophetic to say that, you know, the homeless will always be with us. But, you know, it, it's odd that in this eight day and age, we have not been able to make the situation better. Throwing money at it didn't work. Uh, throwing social services at it didn't work. Uh, allowing a, a freer culture with less uh, less conduct and invasion by uh, the police hasn't worked. Um, so I, 
you know, do I have the answer? No, but I do, as an observer, know that what's what's happening in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Minneapolis is not working in Chicago. Hey, let's let's include Chicago and all that. Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, so, all right, uh, we are here in Spearfish, South Dakota, for three more hours. This is as far west as we're going uh, on this 2023 uh, travel season. We're going to head back uh, now to the east eventually making our way up to international falls minnesota we'll spend a couple weeks up there and uh, in the wisconsin area again and slowly head back to florida to be there by december uh, i'll keep you updated as we travel georgia I i'm looking at the news and there is a lot of news going on in fact i don't think the news could be any worse for the church of england uh without a, a you know a, a dead archbishop somewhere so let's let's before we get to that let's do the albany story the albany candidates uh have all been asked about whether or not they would uh perform or uh, bless uh, uh same-sex functions or blessings in the in their in the diocese if they're elected the next bishop of albany interesting responses yes there are four four candidates on the slate and they were asked, would they abide by the Episcopal Church's constitution canons? And they all said yes. And then they got, then the, the questions drilled down a little bit. Would you do gay marriages? Would you, are you okay with them? And we had, interesting, one said yes. He's from out of town. <laughs> so you've got one candidate on the slate who will make Albany just like, uh, he's an affirming Anglo Catholic. Then you had a local fellow who said, no, I wouldn't do that. So you have somebody who is publicly upholding the uh, traditional stance. And then you have two who basically said, I don't want to answer, which is essentially saying they're not going to do it, but they don't want to get nailed for it. So I do not know the currents of thought in Albany about who will be picked, who won't be picked. There is a very vocal liberal minority in Albany that will make life difficult for any conservative, uh, but they don't have enough to elect a liberal. So we'll see. Uh, will they want somebody who's straightforward or will they want somebody who's trying to, going to try to work the system to avoid the conflict by basically saying, I don't know. We'll see how that turns out. We will. If I mean, uh, if history shows... Uh, whether it be Mark Lawrence um, or, or other bishops, um, how the bishop responds to these types of situations is best done uh, pre-conflict. Like in in Central Florida, uh, there's just no way for a uh, gay uh, priest to show up there and yeah. cause trouble. And in Central Florida, it's can't, you know Justin Holcomb, who's now the bishop, he was just consecrated two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there was never any question of where he stood on this issue. It was a non-issue in the sense that uh, he would uphold the Constitution canons of the Episcopal Church, but we weren't going to do it around here, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, he didn't prevaricate. He didn't try to sort of split the difference or try to come up with some way of non-answering. And that's part of, well, part of Charlie Holt's problem, I think, in Florida was that even though everyone knows his personal views were identical to Justin Holcomb's, his answers were such that, I don't know whether it displayed weakness or indecision, or whether the people just didn't trust his answer, but he's been being hammered uh, and ultimately may not get through. And well, if he I does get through, he's going to be handicapped by what he said in the, in the promises he made to get, to get this far. I think when you're asked the same question by different groups three and four times and you keep responding to it and your answer is just a little different for that group, it kind of comes off as disingenuous. And mm -hmm. I think that may have been Charlie Holtz's uh, problem. You know, not that he's disingenuous, but his answers uh, came off that way where he's just, you know, trying to codify those who wouldn't vote that they would vote for him. So. I wish him all the success. He's yeah. a wonderful human being. He's a great guy. And I just feel badly that he has had to go through this terrible process because, gosh, I, I've i never had to, to go through what he goes through. Would I be able to help uphold uh, 
would I stand fast or stand (laughs) firm? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a situation I've been in as a layperson, which is about a billion times easier than doing it as an uh, Episcopal, but... Those are gone days in my life, George. All right, so I would say for the the rest of this episode, we're going to be talking about the Church of England, who is having a synod, their general synod this week, and um, lots of news is coming out of there. Before we get to talking just about synod, we need to give a little background because there's a lot of viewers here. And living, love, and faith is one of the things they're going to talk about at Synod or have talked about. But I want to give our viewers who are brand new here just a a quick uh, 30-second summary. What is living, love, and faith, George? It's a process uh, that has resulted in the Church of England being on the brink of permitting same-sex blessings. Mm -hmm. And the in principle, the bishops are in favor of it. They're now trying to work out what it would look like and what a pastoral accommodation, what opt-out principles there might be for those who are against it. That, in a nutshell, it's not what it was. It, initially, it was not what it was supposed to be. It's just that's how it's morphed over time into a vehicle to introduce same-sex blessings into the Church of England. And this is... This week has shown what an utter fiasco the process has been. Okay. Uh, But that's just a little background. Let's give a little background on the safeguarding. There's a safeguarding committee there that is designed to prevent future uh, um, atrocities while supporting the victims of current and past atrocities. In 2022, uh, the Archbishop's Council, which is sort of the small group that essentially runs the church between synods akin Mm -hmm. to the executive council of the episcopal church and standing committees of diocese and whatnot it set up a three-member independent safeguarding board to to take forward uh safeguarding in the church of england church of england's had a miserable record of safeguarding miserable in the sense that it doesn't have any more perverts than any other institution Per, day, per capita, you'll find just as many in the teaching professions, in the Catholic Church, this, that, and the other. Rather, it has been the Church of England's institutional response has been a failure after failure after failure after failure. There are, you know, we can speak at great length about the, the, the John Smythe, uh, who was the uh, uh, f- person who would beat schoolboys, beat Christianity into them with whips, and Justin Welby uh, allegedly knew about this for 30 years, and nobody ever said anything, did anything, and other people like that. Um, to uh, Trevor uh, Devanikan, the, the Trevor case, he has an, he has an Indian sure. last name I can't pronounce. <laughs> That's all right. Where the Bishop of Oxford and John, uh, Stephen Croft and John Spintamu were made aware that there was a priest who was a rapist, and for all intents and purposes, they did nothing for several years. They covered it up, they ignored it, they blamed the victim for making a problem, making this an issue. Well, the Independent Safeguarding Board was set up uh, to be independent of the Church of England so that the institution wouldn't crush it through inertia. And three members were appointed, an insider named Meg Munn and two outsiders, and their names were Steve Reeves, Superman, and uh, uh, Jasvinder Sangera, a man and a woman. They were victim advocates. They were people with experience in safeguarding. And they began the work of reaching out to victims, talking to them, trying to get things together. Well, there were problems of communication. That's a polite way of saying that the uh, things were not going well because they were doing too good of a job, it seems. And they were too independent. And they were pushing real safeguarding. And the Archbishop's Council felt that this was not what they had. They had buyer's remorse. And there were debates within the Archbishop's Council. What do we do about these uh, loose cannons? And the Church of England basically announced that they were going to fire everybody and shut the whole thing down and start over again. 
And over the past few weeks, we had Stephen Cottrell on the, the, the radio, the BBC, saying why this had to be done and all this and that, people defending the firings. And then this week, we, you know, and, but it was a fiasco because it basically showed that the safeguarding board, they fired the two independent people for being too independent. And it wasn't really independent because it could be, they were, could be fired at will by this, by the Church of England's leadership. Well, this week starts and within Synod, there's a little discussion of safeguarding <clears throat> and it blows up. It blows up. Um, on the 9th of July, they had the presentation and the members of Synod, the rank and file, wanted to hear these two fired people speak. And yeah. the Synod leader said no. And then people started doing slow clapping, you know, just expressing, you know, basically paralyzing. And well, they weren't on the agenda and they weren't members of Synod. So it's out of order. What do you, you can, of, if the Church of England is one thing, it's order, you know. <laughs> And so they, they, they had a, they decided to suspend proceedings and officially be out of session, but unofficially remain seated and listen to these people for 15 minutes. And Steve Reeves uh, told the meeting that the breakdown was due to the church's refusal, refusal to receive a view independent of, of, about independent safeguarding different from the views that they already were holding. Mm -hmm. so they didn't want to hear what these people were saying. And the, uh, the, the woman, Jezvinder uh, Sangera, said, you know, the months they had spent building trust with the victims of abuse had all been ripped away. Uh, and basically, we're, it's not that we're starting over. We're starting a little farther back. Um, Justin Welby was asked by Sam Margrave, a uh, friend of this show, member of General Synod, um, how did you vote? And Welby said, well, uh, I, uh, 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 I voted uh. <laughs> against it. I voted against it. I initially was against it. Uh -huh. But then the official spokesman said, well, everybody, it was a unanimous vote. And so Margrave has followed up with the supplemental saying, Archbishop, were you lying to us? Uh, could you explain how could, you know, he gave an Al Gore answer about the Iraq, like Al Gore in the Iraq war. I was for it before I was against it. Um, so Welby has been prevaricating. Cottrell also has been prevaricating. And we're getting insiders saying, well, three bishops, two archbishops and one bishop on the council were against it. But eventually they all decided to vote unanimously. Uh, in favor of it. So you can't even get a straight story about why they did this other than institutional preservation. Well, you, you posted a story called Everyone Gets Thrown Under the Bus. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to post a, a, a quick link to this on the show here. Um, and kind of that's the modus operandi here that everybody is to blame for this fiasco except me, Archbishop of Canterbury, or us, the Church of England, or us, Synod. Um, and we've seen this before, but it's now just so apparent that they have no idea what they're doing other than trying to preserve their broken institution. Um, One of the comments from last week's show, I think aptly summarized it, uh, mm -hmm. it essentially said there's a difference between management and leadership. In times of crisis, you need leadership. You need somebody to take the institution and move it out of the, the mess that it's in. And that takes leadership. Management just basically tends the machine. And the Church of England has been hiring managers to be bishops for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And Welby is a manager. He's not a leader. And so the Church of England essentially right now as an institution is leaderless. It's got plenty of people in charge of this and that and the other. But the the bureaucrats, the sort of unseen blob that run the show are now more powerful than the archbishops and the bishops because there's no one who will stand up and say, A, take responsibility for failure. Stephen Cottrell got up and apologized for the terrible safeguarding failure, but then blamed everybody else for the failure. He, you know, it was one of these, I'm sorry that you're upset apologies. But we, you know. 
Well, you also posted a story on Anglic.inc um, about our father being problematic. Now, this is by Stephen Cartel, and I, I, I'm a lay person. I know after reading uh, the Bible many times, that God's chosen pronoun is I am and Father. <laughs> so I think, you know, it, he, God has really told us who he wants to be identified as. Uh, we have a little trouble with the Church of England and Stephen Cartel coming on board and understanding that just because Stephen Cartel is a bad father and uh, Justin Welby is a bad father, that doesn't mean all uh, fathers are bad fathers, and that maybe our father is not uh, such a bad way to address the Creator, George. Well, Kevin, do you remember we used to say about Catherine Jeffrey Shorey? She was the gift, the gift on giving Anglican Ink. We yeah. Anglican Unscripted had something every week when she was in charge because she would just say and do the most silly things. Like, you remember when? The Apostle Paul was wrong to cast out the demon in the slave girl in yeah, Ephesus. Unemployed, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. or that uh, the Episcopalians are better educated and smarter than regular Americans, therefore they have less children. That's why mm -hmm. we're declining in numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Stephen Cottrell is a, is approaching Catherine Jefford Shorey levels of inanity and silliness. Cottrell gave the presidential address General Synod's in York this time of year, and he's the Archbishop of York, so he gave the address. Now, a little background. Back in February, uh, we had some uh, stories, and we talked about this on Anglican Unscripted, where the Church of England was going to consider gender-neutral terms for God. Right. They had a committee set up, uh, led by the bishop, I think it was Litchfield, or his vice chair. The, Litchfield is the vice chair of the liturgical commission. And the liturgical mission of the Church of England was going to look into how can we remove patriarchal language? You know, you know, the no, uh, instead of all the woke junk that we're all familiar with from business world and academia and everything, all the craziness, the Church of England wants to get into that too. Well, we had an example of this craziness in action. Now, in his presidential address, the Archbishop of York said that using the word, the Lord's Prayer was problematic. And let me read you the quote that he said. Cottrell said, I know the word father is problematic for those whose experience of earthly fathers has been destructive and abusive. And for all of us who have labored rather too much from an oppressively patriarchal grip, grip, grip on life. Now, 90% of his uh, address was not about the problem with the Lord's Prayer. It was He focused on the our business. We need to be together, this and that. But he kicked off by displaying his woke credentials, his, you know, church Virtu of what's happening now. Virtual signaling. Um, Oh, about 25 years ago, there was a columnist, uh, a satirist named Peter, who had a column in the Telegraph named Peter Simple. And one of his characters was uh, the go-getting go bishop of uh, Streatham, I think it was. Um, well, this, uh, this bishop was, if you will, the caricature of everything that was trendy and hip and this and that. And here's the problem, you can't do, Peter Simple couldn't write that satire today because Stephen Cottrell has taken, uh, the, the character was Bishop Spacely Trellis, a hyphenated name. Sure. Bishop Spacely Trellis has come into life as Stephen Cottrell. You can't caricature Stephen Cottrell because he's already a caricature. Now, I think the issue here is that you know, and we've had some really great, yeah, you know, this is the gift the kids on giving. We put put out these stories and we've get tens of thousands of people reading them. Whereas I have this really deep <clears throat> investigative story in Indian corruption and me and my mother-in-law are the only two who read it. <laughs> well, I'm watching, I got the, an update last night on the stats from Anglican.inc. And, you know, we, we do a, a nice solid 6,000 viewers a day and I get a little blip up 345%. 
what, what what's yeah. going on here and uh, uh, clearly yeah, you, you posted a, a calvin robinson story that got uh, a good fourteen thousand views you, you we've been doing a good follow-up what's happening in general synod but it's not us it's the characters you're talking about uh justin welby did a, an interview where he was very pro trans kids uh with the uh united kingdom but he's also pro censorship for those who opposed uh the trans movement and the gender identity movement in england and that's that's wrong george that's i gotta hey, yeah okay if you as a country are going to slaughter your children and cut off their genitals I, I, not much I can do except complain and point to scripture, but if you're going to censor me, uh, that that's that's a that's a whole new set, George. Yeah, Justin Welby spoke at uh, a side meeting at uh, General Synod, and he generated more headlines for himself than the actual proceedings that day. First, he denounced anti-Semitism, and uh, but at the same time, he denounced Zionism in Israel. So he was trying to be balancing. He was like the Canadians last week. Yeah. The Canadian Synod uh, got rid of uh, the Good Friday prayers for the conversions of Jews, Jews, but denounced the state of Israel. They wanted to be even-handed. Welby did the sort of same thing, uh, denouncing anti-Semitism while at the same time denouncing the state of Israel and uh, Zionism. But the big things that he did, and then he had the thing, well, we need to impose a carbon tax on energy companies. See, now that we've sold our Shell shares, I can't say that five they times. Don't. <laughs> we can't tell Shell what to do, and we've just figured it out. Now they're not going to listen to us because we're not shareholders. So what we need to do is impose a carbon tax and on all energy producing, uh, all fossil fuel producing uh, entities to fund the greeny weeny revolution and get rid of uh, the internal combustion engine and because we've only we've got less than 10 years or as Greta Thunberg said the five you know Greta Thunberg's five years was up last month uh, but you know he's drunk the, the Greta Kool-Aid that if we get rid of the internal combustion engine in Britain or in the United States, all shall be well, even though it's China that produces the vast majority of greenhouse gases from their coal plants, and they're not going to do what uh, Justin Welby says. But those were two things. But then the third was, he came squarely down in favor of transgender kids within Church of England schools being allowed to, you know, boys wearing dresses and uh, and to be addressed by the pronoun they preferred. Uh, he basically, he's Justin Welby has missed the curve and he's now jumped on board the transgender uh, boat bus, just as that whole bus is careening off the side of the road about to smash into the, a tree. He's in, he's in favor of censorship, of requiring you to call somebody by the name that they believe or the gender they believe they have that free speech needs to be subordinated to the feelings of transgender people whatever those feelings might be now um, well now, now let's don't back mention up. that this is a mental illness by the right. way right well and it's interesting because in england especially in the nhs they have decided to stop prescribing uh puberty blockers and uh, surgery for kids who have gender dysphoria. They've decided, after doing study after study, that 95% of children who identify as the opposite sex are confused. If you leave them alone and do not intervene and do not give them puberty blockers and do not cut them up, they return to the same gender as their biology. Mm -hmm. uh, 95%. Okay. That's what are we doing if ninety five percent come out of this delusion uh, after a couple of years and identify as their bio biological sex? Why are we uh, allowing or permitting or uh, excusing uh, the lack of mental therapy, the uh, excessive puberty uh, um, th therapy, blocker therapy, and surgery? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if Justin Welby could be more wrong on a topic, it would be trans. 
and he's he's wrong on a lot of topics. So, so Justin, uh, Justin gave gave he gave Cottrell a good run for his money, but uh, but you know, from a newspaper point of view, an archbishop sounding off about carbon taxes and and Israel and transgenderism, yeah, that's not really their job. An archbishop telling us the Lord's prayer is is screwy. That's his job. Now, next thing he we're next uh, we're going to hear from him that well we really can't pray uh, and ask you know the Virgin Mary is problematic too <laughs> yeah. because you know some of us had mean mothers witchy mothers and therefore if we have any mention of Mary whatsoever uh, that really is problematic not from a traditional Protestant perspective but from you know a uh, an evil stepmother point of view from a fairy tale. It, you know, it, you have to, I think it, you need to give Jesus some credit uh, in the sense that he lived in the real world. He was a real person who encountered real people and he no doubt met men and women who had rotten fathers and rotten mothers. Sure. But when the disciples said, teach us how to pray, Jesus said, begin Abba, our father. Um, I would rather listen to Jesus than Stephen Cottrell and the feminist or the kook lobby on this point. Um, it's interesting in church history, I don't see any complaints about uh, God being male, uh, but for maybe 130 years ago. You know, this is more of a, a, a recent issue. So even though they had bad parents back in the uh, first 15 centuries of the church, uh, they were not so bad as to uh, reach Stephen Cartel's level of, oh, it's problematic. They're only problematic now in the, uh, the 21st century, George. And, and problematic is the weasel word of the year. Mm. It's, a, it's a passive aggressive way of saying, this is crap but you're not being offensive by saying it. It's problematic, meaning for me, I have a problem with it. It may be okay for you, but for a sensitive little me, it's problematic. Mm -hmm. That's so, yeah. okay, I'll say it. It's so unmanly of Cottrell. It's so, such a failure of leadership. You know, speak clearly, let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes and don't try to be such a weenie. Um, oh, uh, Kevin, I'm reverting to an eight-year. Uh, I'm reverting to an eight-year-old. I want to beat up Stephen Cottrell in the playground for being a weenie. I'm Is sorry. That, well, no. I mean, we've said this many times. I, I certainly have that. The problem we have right now is certainly the church, liberal society uh, uh, here in the West, the Democratic Party, are trying to redefine or undefine entities. They have redefined what it means to be a woman. They've redefined what it means to be a man, what marriage is. Uh, all these institutions have been re redefined. The Church of England is trying to redefine who God is, what God blesses, uh, who he is as an entity, and his pronouns. A and it's problematic when you do that. Very problematic to undefine God. God is very definable in the New and Old Testament. And God, to his credit, defines himself in the Old and New Testament. We don't need mm -hmm. Stephen Cortell, Justin Wabi, or any of the bishops of the Church of England to tell us who God is. God is revealed through Scripture. And to, to change that is at our own peril. So, All right, so mm -hmm. now that's the, kind of the outside of what's going on. I want to talk a little bit about the meeting because... Uh, I thought for sure the LLF, which we discussed, the Living Love and Faith, was going to be decided at this synod. Apparently, they're kicking the can down the road. Kicking a can down to November. Uh, mm -hmm. Sarah Mullally, the Bishop of London, who's in charge of the LLF process, gave an overview of where things are. And the committees they formed after the last synod to address issues of pastoral concern and this and that, they've all concluded their work. Uh, but they're no further down the road. They're still working on it. And so any time anybody had a hard question to ask, the, wrote, the default answer was, well, that's part of the pastoral accommodation that we still need to work out. 
So what we've seen is that the positions have hardened. There's no real change. Some things have been let slip, such as the uh, third province call, where there's two provinces now, Canterbury and York, and some had hoped that a third province for conservatives alongside the other two would be set up. The bishops have essentially said, no, we don't wish to surrender our power. We would need just to find it a pastoral accommodation to allow you people who disagree with us to uh, go forward. There's some behind the scenes uh, moves. Uh, 20, I believe it was 22, 22 leaders of various church organizations and prominent uh, people in the Church of England put out a letter just before the start of Synod, which we published in Anglican Inc. Uh, uh, it was, you can see it on the website. Um, and it was marked uh, personal and confidential. So I was thinking, <laughs> should I first, should, should I not publish it? And then the Church Times published it. I said, well, we can ever, everybody can blame them because they left off personal and confidential on the top of it. Well, this letter basically said, look, the bishops don't really have the theological and legal authority to go ahead and just ramrod this through. Um, they're trying to split hairs between, well, this is doctrine, and that's teaching, and doctrine and teaching are different. No, they're not. Or this is practice, and this is pastoral, and this is theological, and they're all different. No, they're not. One has to depend on the other. So prominent leaders of the Church of England said it must legally and theologically go through and have a full, robust debate in synods so that we don't have a, a mealy-mouthed accommodation. We know where things stand. And then there's another letter that's been going around, which I've not seen. I've only seen reports of it, um, where a group of conservative bishops have basically backed these, uh, these the, the, lay, the lay and clergy leaders, while a larger group of liberal bishops I think it was like 20 and 40, I mean, uh, in, in amongst the bishops have said, look, uh, the, the liberals are saying, we've got to go through and do this. We've got to bite the bullet, introduce gay marriage. We have the authority as bishops to do it. Let's go. Whereas the conservative group are saying, no, you don't have the authority. No, you cannot do this. So there's a break within the House of Bishops itself. Now, the break's not been made public yet, which... Uh, We'll see how long that lasts, because the liberals are always the first to sort of sh shout out and say this is what they're going to do. But we'll see how this unfolds. But the church figure is not well as an institution. It's leaderless. It's rudderless. It's divided among its key leaders. And its, it's image in the world, based on the ISB fiasco um, and other things, is just dreadful. It is because it has kind of a Tony Blair as a leader, and at this moment, it kind of needs a Winston Churchill as a leader. You know, mm -hmm. somebody who's going to uh, be the guy who's going to make the hard, hard decisions. Nobody in the Church of England wants to make a hard decision. Uh, they don't even know what that means. What is a hard decision? Uh, let's see. So let's go through you got the General Synod, Pro Trans, Our Father's Problematic, Carbon Tax, Safeguarding, LLF. <gasps> We didn't talk about the Welby table, the Where's Welby table. So we got, we have friends on Facebook and we got some uh, personal messages from, I, d I don't know if we can name him or not, but uh, one of our viewers who said, I was at the Where's Welby table inside the uh, um, courtyard of the church and we were harassed and asked to leave and lied about and accused of uh, many things. So let's talk about the Where's Welby table. Um, who are they and what really happened? Where's Welby is a group that was made its first visit to General Synod and to York Minister, Minster this past week. Mm -hmm. And it's a group that essentially is saying, where's Welby on the issues of abuse? Where's Welby? Basically, it's a small group of activists trying to hold him account to account for his failures of leadership. They had a little table set up within the Minster Commons area, a courtyard, and next to them was the Christian Climate Action. And these are the people who have disrupted church services, who have done die-ins, who blocked street traffic, saying the Church of England has to divest from fossil fuels, so on and so forth. Well, the Bishop of in Europe, Robert Innes, came up 
saw them and chew them out for being mean to Welby. Then Vivian Fall, I think, the Bishop of Bristol, also came up, exoriated them very heatedly for being unpleasant and this and that. And before they even got started, uh, the York Minster Police, yes, the cathedral has its own police force. It's Deputy Fife came up yes. <laughs> and told them they had to leave. Why did they have to leave? Well, because they were disrupting things and they had disrupted church services in the past. Well, this is the first meeting they've ever been to. And they're right next to Christian Climate Action, which has, as we have reported on Anglican Unscripted and Anglican Inc., disrupted services across the Church of England for a year now has disrupted train traffic, has done all these crazy things. They're allowed to stay, but the where's Welby table because of two angry bishops uh, ratting to the police that these are terrorists in the making, if you will, are kicked out. Now, I've tried, I've not written up this up yet because I've tried to get a contrary statement from the Minster police um, but, you know, they don't answer because uh, it makes them look like idiots. Uh, so I'll probably run with this just with what I have shortly. Mm -hmm. But it's what does it tell you about an organization that is so brittle, so fragile, that a uh, two hysterical bishops can take out their anger and frustration at the failure of the institution on a little group of protesters? Um, my goodness, it's, you know, it just speaks so deeply to me as to the utter, this, their over-the-top response to a very mild protest that did not disrupt anything, but rest questioned authority, speaks to the failure of that institution and its impending implosion. Well, um, now... We've seen this before. We saw that the response to a story was worse than the story itself. We mm -hmm. saw this with the EMEA, the EMEA, the EMEA imploded. We've seen this with organization after organization where they look at, you know, the messenger and try to kill the messenger. Mm -hmm. And the, the where's Welby table is another messenger uh, trying to discover where he is on these topics that he says is so important to him. And clear that they're not important to him or the Church of England, and they're being vilified for just pointing that out, which is a shame. Now, you and I have been vilified many times for pointing things out. Um, three weeks ago, we talked about ACTA having a bad week. Uh, ACTA has recovered. We talk about the Church of England having bad weeks and bad synods and bad decades all the time. I'm waiting for the Church of England to recover. Has it happened yet, George? Another, another thing along these lines is that members of Synod may ask questions and they're put to the archbishops and the, or the, bishop, or the appropriate people. Mm -hmm. And what I've been told by some of the members of Synod who are friends of this show is that they have put forward questions that have said, no, we, you're not allowed to ask that question. It's out of order, it's illegal, it's off topic. I'll give you an example that a question. Justin Welby has been pushing Peter Tatchell. Peter Tatchell is the gay activist mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is prominent in the news all the time. Tatchell uh, has uh, made some videos and has some statements where he affirms that it's okay for 12-year-olds to basically have sex with adults. That he knows gay men who wanted, when they were 12, wanted to have sex, therefore it should be legalized. And Tatch and the question was to Welby, why are you upholding this man as somebody we should listen to on human sexuality when he is in favor of ebiophilia, mm -hmm. which is the technical term of, for pedophilia of that age group? Now, well, that's out of bounds. That's not allowed. That's not part of synod business. We're talking human sexuality. We're talking people the archbishop is promoting and presenting as people we should listen to. Mm -hmm. And when that is questioned, oh, we can't ask that question. Um, when an institution is so insecure that it cannot respond but must shut down discussion, we're like in the Soviet Union days, in the last days, when everybody knows it's a joke, 
and we're just waiting for the the whole rotten edifice to fall over hmm. we've seen this with the uh police arresting a lady for thinking what she was praying um you know now the church of england is like reading uh not scripture but reading the book 1984. we certainly through this general center we saw new speak we've seen you know uh, the ministry of truth uh i can't wait for uh, a final report from general synod george enough church of england um it's not worse off but they're not having a good week either we're going to talk about the roman catholic church um because we have how many minutes left we got 15 minutes let's spend at least five talking about the roman catholics they're they're having a bad week in the press francis is making some decisions that just makes my my eyebrows go what so <laughs> let's talk about that george the uh roman catholic church is uh for for traditionalist conservative minded catholics this has mm -hmm. been a very bad week very bad week. Uh, first off, uh, Pope Francis uh, had a buddy from Argentina, Archbishop Tuco Fernandez, I think his name is, tu Tuco Tucho Fernandez, the bishop, Archbishop of uh, La Plata in Argentina, appointed the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. That's what Cardinal Ratzinger had been in charge of. It's the former Holy Office, the Inquisition. It sort of sets the doctrinal boundaries. This guy's out there. He's a liberal, and he's he infamously wrote a book about uh, finding faith through kissing or words to that effect for teenagers. That's, and, no, that's that was the words. Okay. Yeah, and he uh, he also in an interview with one of the Vatican uh, news outlets uh, said that uh, he would explore same-sex blessings to see how we could make this work. So here's somebody who didn't say it's impossible. He said, "Well, we'll find a way to make it work." So this is the head of the doctrine office, and he's saying, okay, we're going to change the doctrine on marriage so that we can now have blessings and not contradict the church's lifelong teachings. We're going to try to find a way forward. So this is somebody who was hoping that there would be a doorstop or a backstop to prevent further sliding into being a, uh, Episcopalians. The, uh, this, is, this is bad news. And Archbishop uh, Fernandez could very well be an Episcopalian for the for the what he th writes and says and thinks on these human sexuality issues, or an affirming Catholic. Second, their name the Pope is naming delegates to this upcoming synod, which will sort of look at uh, the big issues. And there were four delegates from the United States named. And if you are a conservative American Catholic, you are basically having heart failure because uh, the new cardinal from San Diego, McElroy, Arch, uh, the cardinal from Washington, Wilton, and mm -hmm. Blaise Cupich from Chicago, two of the three of those guys are just way out there. Uh, Cupich is part of the old, uh, old network of old boys that protected... Uh, uh, the old arch, the old Archbishop of Washington, who was the pedophile or was the rapist, and then the fourth is Father James Martin, the Jesuit, who is really out there on gay stuff and is continuously pushing the gay agenda within the Catholic Church. These three people, and three of, and all four of them, would be considered on the left of the Catholic spectrum. That's going to represent the United States, and I can't bring that degree of uh, analysis to the other picks from other countries, but it does certainly look like Francis is setting things up for a predetermined outcome, which is not favorable to the maintenance of the uh, faith once received from the saints. Well, we, the Roman Catholic Church has never really talked about changing their doctrine. But if you, if you look at how the church operates, especially here in America, uh, it, it is sadly a very pro-homosexual church mm -hmm. uh, as far as who is in leadership of many of these churches and bishops and canons and deans and stuff like that uh, so no you're not changing your doctrine now you're starting to discuss that now you're setting up the ability to practice what you preach by changing what you preach the the, the cry of 
Michael Nazarelli, when he went into the Roman Catholic Church, was that there's a magisterium in Catholicism, that there's a bedrock of faith that is unchanging, whereas in the Anglican world, we don't have a magisterium. Which is now, true. What, there's truth to that statement. Yeah. Uh, even uh, talking to Archbishop Duncan, you know, it'd be nice if we had a magisterium, but we're never going to have a magisterium. So, yeah. well, these changes that the that the that people like James Martin and Cupich and McElroy and whatnot are seeking to pursue um, the. Uh, St. Gallen Group, which is the a t city in Switzerland where the liberal cardinals gathered before the election of Francis to sort of polit decide how to do this. Yeah. The St. Gallen Group seeks to, in essence, basically change the magisterium into a synodical one that is akin to, if you would say, if we did have a synodical view of things in the Episcopal world, the Anglican world. It's sort of the majority plus one view is what the faith is. That's a, that can be a failure, and that's wrong at times. But that is where they're going. Um, and if I were a traditional Catholic, I would be quite concerned because, um, now I have no desire to be a Roman Catholic. I don't have believe in some of the doctrines that are necessary for a Catholic to believe in, therefore I shouldn't be a Catholic. But I admire its rigor. And what is being lost in the synodical process is its claim to rigor and a magisterium, the very things that Michael Nazarelli sought to find when he left the Catholic Church, left the Anglican Church, is now in danger of being taken away from the Catholic Church. Now, people may say, oh, well, this will never happen. But, you know, who in 1968 would have thought where the Episcopal Church would be today? We've got three million, four million members. Now we've got less than a half a million in church on Sunday. Who would have thought that could have happened? It happens. It's a, and it's continuing to happen. Uh, except for, you know, maybe the ACNA and a couple other denominations, the trajectory of church attendance and the trajectory of people who call themselves Christian is down. It's way down. Um, mm -hmm. Here in America, every time they do a, a, a poll, you're just like, I can't believe this is happening. Uh, and around the world. Now, there are countries that are maintaining their faith in the Christianity. Uh, I don't know how, because we can't seem to do it here in the West. Uh, we'd just become a bunch of pagan narcissists over here. But and that be said. See, yeah. And the uh, this is a good time to be in the ACNA, because in essence, you can gr plan your growth in areas where you know there's still Christendom, or you know there are people who desire the, the, what you're bringing. Mm -hmm. If you're an old line church that has always been in Hooterville for a hundred years, and you're stuck with declining church attendance, declining interest from the young people, um, it's a tough situation. And you know the Southern Baptists are seeing losses. Every, you know everybody across the board, with a few exceptions. Um, well, we've not reported it here, but the Methodists have completely imploded, yeah. and are, are now dividing property. Uh, I, I've been looking for a Methodist to interview, a Methodist leader to interview, and they all say, we don't want to talk about it. Well, okay, fine. You know, but at a certain point, you know, uh, that needs to be made more of national news. Well, my, my long-term hope is that uh, we find a way that we conservative Anglicans, we can merge with conservative Lutherans, Methodists, mm -hmm. Presbyterians, and really do build the kingdom of God together with the common work. Because, you know, that what unites me, what separates, there's more that separates me from a liberal Episcopalian than there does with a conservative Catholic or a conservative Presbyterian. Sure. Um, not, but I'm not a conservative Calvinist, nor am I a conservative uh, Roman Catholic. But I have more in Kent common with them than I do with the, with the majority of the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church. Oh, absolutely. No question about that. Okay, I think we've made it to another end of an episode. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 811 of Anglican Unscripted.